everyone and welcome to the podcast of English composer Andrew Downs. My name is Paula Downs, I'm Andrew's younger daughter and on today's show I'm going to be reading chapter 10 from my granddad's book Around the Horn by Frank Downs. Chapter 10 includes Paris, Versailles, Folie Bergère, Lyon, Klaus Barbie, Collapse of German Army, Victory Parades, London, Curfew, Non Fraternisation, Dennis Matthews plays at Potsdam, Churchill, Stalin, Truman, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Back to England, Denham Studios, Ted Heath Band. Paris was our base for the next tour, which included visits to French cities as far apart as Marseille and Lyon, when mercifully we had the services of a Dakota aircraft. Billeted in an American hotel, we could not believe our good fortune. The food was incredibly good after the experiences of Belgium and Holland, so much so that at our first meal some of our colleagues began to leave the table after the hors d'oeuvre, thinking that was it. The hospitality was superlative, even stretching to a cup of tea in bed each morning served by French maids. It was so overwhelming, in fact, that our driver, a stocky Geordie from Newcastle, got involved with one of these early morning tea providers and lost a stone in weight whilst we were there. He was visibly fading away. The Parisians welcomed us warmly. On our first march down the Champs-Élysées, the enthusiasm from the vast crowds completely engulfed the procession which broke up in disarray as we were eventually separated from the ranks behind us. However, it was all very good-humoured and friendly, in spite of the disruption. Our schedule was a very busy one, visiting airfields in the region, and I single out Vitry as the most memorable. We gave an afternoon concert in the Naffy, and in the evening, Solomon, in uniform and on a tour with Ensa, gave an astounding recital on a very mediocre upright piano. It was received rapturously by a capacity audience. What a great player he was, and what a delightful man. It was always a great thrill to me, later in my career, to play in an orchestra when he was the soloist particularly when he played the Brahms concertos. It was sad to see when we played at the Palace of Versailles how neglected it had been during the Nazi occupation. Many of the pictures we saw were almost ruined by damp and the building generally was in need of urgent repair. Back in Paris, we gave a series of concerts in the Marigny Theatre on the Champs-Élysées and open-air concerts in the bandstand which was almost opposite. It was in this theatre that I first heard the magnificent Glenn Miller Band. I had always admired the wonderful trombone playing of Glenn Miller on radio and on record. Sadly, he was missing at that time, not having returned from a visit to England, but the band, directed by Sergeant Ray McKinley, was still in top form and drew tremendously enthusiastic audiences. The orchestra was versatile and included many players from famous American orchestras and bands. I well remember an electrifying performance by the strings of the orchestra of Paganini's Concert Allegro, Moto Perpetuo, Opus 12, which was followed after the interval by works of Duke Ellington and Gershwin. The sense of ensemble of the saxophone and brass sections was a revelation. They were most friendly and easygoing musicians. Mel Powell, the pianist who incidentally wrote the famous signature tune of the band, and Ray McKinley, the percussionist and conductor, being particularly so. Frequently, other players would attend our open-air concerts in the bandstand on the Elysee, giving us enthusiastic support. Our engagements in Paris were certainly varied, with appearances on radio and on a fast-moving variety show where a revolving platform assembled each act behind a screen before revolving to face the audience. True to form, one of our percussionists fell off with a crash and got the loudest applause of the evening. The audience thought it part of the act. 
Our visit to the Folie Bergère, where many of us younger musicians witnessed the exciting spectacle of young topless dancers for the first time, was memorable too for the amount of champagne we drank that evening. Most of it, thank goodness, after we had played, though we were given a bottle each on our arrival. It was good to travel by air to Marseille after the tedious and often dust-choked roads of previous long journeys. Our Dakota, though very austere in seating accommodation, benches along each side, was as steady as a rock on the outward journey, though we did hit a few air pockets here and there, which greatly disturbed one of our older colleagues, Norman Hester. Norman, one of our bass players, a very good one too, came into the RAF from the BBC Theatre Orchestra and was a highly strung, very nervous individual. I remember him saying to the Canadian pilot as he came on board, I feel terribly nervous, sir. How do you think I feel? said the Canadian. I've got to fly the bloody thing. Our first sight of the Mediterranean as we flew into Marseille was quite incredible. I had never seen such a wonderful blue as the sea shimmered below us. The heat too was overwhelming as we left the plain. Billeted in huts on a hillside, we spent a long time that night looking at the star-studded sky. I had never seen so many stars so clearly. We got little sleep, however, owing to the cacophony of croaking bullfrogs in the valley below us. We were given a very warm reception in the city, the second largest in France. Our concerts took place in a YMCA hall to appreciative audiences made up of many nationalities. Flying on to the city of Lyon, there was still ample evidence of the FFI, or Maquis Résistance, to be seen in scrawled protests on houses and public buildings. One name I distinctly remember was that of Klaus Barbie, the hated Nazi war criminal who had tried so desperately to overcome the Maki without success, owing to the fierce resistance he had encountered. Some of the stories we heard about the occupation were simply horrific, but the people talked with pride about the fact that they had freed the city together with Allied forces. Here too we were welcomed warmly, and concerts, some of which were in the open air, were greatly appreciated. April 1945 saw the beginning of the final collapse of the German army, both in the west and east. After a brief return to Paris, we once more made our way to Brussels and were given two weeks leave in England, with the proviso that we might be called back for duty. We therefore presumed that the end of the war was imminent and we might be needed for ceremonial duties. Nevertheless, we were hoping that we would get our leave first. In fact, we only managed three days. On May the 4th, we were called back by individual telegram to report to Croydon before flying out to Brussels. May the 7th saw the unconditional surrender of Germany and the next day, May 8th, was declared VE Day. Victory parades took place in London, Paris and Brussels. All the guards, bands and RAF Central Band worked overtime. Amid scenes of jubilation, we marched countless miles, practically exhausting the large repertoire of marches with Sousa and Kenneth Alford well to the fore, not forgetting, of course, the Wolford Davis Royal Air Force March. Celebrations over, we were sent to Germany to entertain the Allied forces of occupation. It was a long, tiring journey and rather depressing as we crossed the Rhine at Cologne and saw the destruction throughout the towns in the Ruhr. On our way, we spent two days at a huge camp. The weather was extremely hot and humid. The camp in a forest clearing consisted of hundreds of tents in straight lines, row after row, set out in typical military order. There was no shade, and the intense heat made those two days very uncomfortable indeed. Night for me was also a trial, for in spite of it being mercifully cooler, the latrines were a route march away, and having drunk pints of water to counter a raging thirst, I had to get up in the night to answer the call of nature. I got there, but it was on my way back that I got lost in the pitch-black night. I groped along line after line of tents at around 2am, lifting countless tent flaps to inquire which section I was in. Alas, all I got was snoring and abuse, and in one case, a badly aimed boot. 
It was almost dawn before I found my bed again. Resuming our journey, we eventually arrived at our base, the small but pleasant town of Bukerborg, just outside Hanover. Being billeted in a large four-storey house as a member of the occupying forces had for me an unreal quality. The uneasy feeling as air raid sirens warned all Germans off the streets at dusk. The uncanny atmosphere as we walked along deserted streets. The sullen German faces peering through curtains. Non-fraternisation and the overall resentment added up to an uneasy existence. There was a stark reminder of the terror of previous months only a few yards away from our billet. In a disused warehouse which had been allocated to us for rehearsals, we discovered stacked in neat rows V1 rocket fuselages, which were made of mild steel sheet metal with an overall length including jet tube projection of around 25 feet. There were many other components too intricate to describe. We were only thankful that this consignment at least had not reached the assembly stage. In the course of the next few weeks, life became increasingly tedious. Organisation of our concert schedule seemed to be non-existent. No one seemed to know or understand the real purpose of our being sent to Bukerborg. It was a ludicrous situation. Not that life was without incident. Two such I readily call to mind, both involving my brother Leonard, and on each occasion his life was threatened. Our four-storey house also had a cellar. Several of our colleagues slept with us on the third floor, and on this particular morning we were preoccupied doing our various chores when an excited airman from downstairs burst into the room waving a pistol. Look what I found in the bloody cellar, he explained triumphantly. Bill Overton took it from him to examine it. It's a Luger, he said, and did the one thing every soldier had been taught not to do in such circumstances. He pulled the trigger. There was a flash, a loud bang and then a stunned silence. Leonard fell on the bed in shock. The bullet had shot upwards through the ceiling and on its way had left a deep graze on the side of Leonard's face. Another quarter of an inch to the left and I would have lost a brother. It was some minutes later that we realised the full horror of what might have happened. On the floor above, a colleague standing at his bedside cleaning his buttons narrowly missed having a bullet in his rear quarters as it missed him by inches. We should have reported the incident, but for Bill's sake we dare not. It was a serious offence. He suffered enough, as we all did for some days afterwards. A few days later, Leonard was in trouble again walking alone from the forces club in the centre of the town. The sirens had sounded and the streets were empty of Germans as he made his way in the gathering twilight. On the opposite side of the road coming towards him, he encountered a drunken squadron leader waving a pistol as he swayed unsteadily along the pavement. Seeing Leonard, he lurched into the road, calling out, Airman, Airman, stand still! An order Leonard immediately obeyed. What the bloody hell do you think you are doing on the streets at this time of night? He reeked of whiskey. I'll bring discipline to Bookerborg if it's the last thing I do, he bellowed. Stand to attention and salute. Again, the order was obeyed, although Leonard had already saluted him. Give me your identity card, he stuttered as he waved his pistol dangerously in front of my unfortunate brother. I shall impound this, he said as he took the card and struggled to find his pocket. You will report to me in the morning at HQ, he finally stammered as he staggered off towards the gates of the HQ opposite. Leonard was seething with anger when he arrived at the billet and used language rarely heard from him, but quite clearly he had made up his mind what to do the next morning. Up early and with permission from our sergeant in charge, he made his way to HQ to lodge a formal complaint and he requested to see the commanding officer. This was refused and he found himself in a room facing the offending squadron leader who tried to bluff his way out of the situation by being officious. Placing Leonard's identity card on the desk in front of him, he said curtly, Here's your card and don't let it happen again. Amazed at the man's arrogance, Leonard took his card but stood his ground. Thank you, sir, he said, but I am not satisfied and intend to take the matter further. My life was threatened last night. He was ordered out of the room forthwith.
However, still insisting on his rights, he was eventually promised at a subsequent interview that the matter would be investigated further. Bureaucratic procrastination nevertheless ensured that the affair did not proceed and I shall record how and why later. The month of July 1945 saw the culmination of intense political interest, no more so than in the ranks of the forces abroad. Politics, demobilisation and party affiliations were the main topic of conversation. It became obvious that men and women, in the forces particularly, were looking forward to great changes in the political structure of Great Britain. And it came as no surprise on July the 26th, as the results came through, that a Labour government had been elected with an overwhelming majority. Around this time, I received a welcome letter from Brother Herbert, who hadn't written for some time. He had left the Liverpool Orchestra and was now in London as principal viola of the London Symphony Orchestra. He also said that Walter Legg had invited him to become principal viola of the newly formed Philharmonia Orchestra, an offer which he subsequently accepted and thus began a long association with that orchestra, which lasted until he retired a few years ago. The letter went on to say that he was also very busy playing in the Philharmonia String Quartet and that Dennis Matthews, due to play Schubert's Trout Quintet with them at Wigmore Hall, had had to cancel due to RAF duties and that Walter Suskind had come in at the last minute to deputise. On my return to England some weeks later, Dennis recounted what his duties were. He was involved, musically of course, in the Potsdam Conference. When Churchill, Stalin and Truman met between July the 17th and August the 1st, 1945, to determine Germany's future, Dennis, together with a small group of other RAF musicians, was sent out to entertain as and when required. The group was detailed to play one evening and was placed in an alcove in the banqueting hall of the Sicilianhof to perform whilst the world-famous leaders had dinner. Seen through the eyes of Dennis's fellow musicians, the events that followed must have seemed incredible. From his position at the keyboard, he was escorted by an orderly officer to be presented to the three great war leaders. Imagine the scene, air marshals, naval commanders and army generals all standing to attention round the perimeter of the hall whilst aircraftsman Matthews was at ease and in conversation with Churchill, Truman and Stalin. The situation became even more bizarre when Churchill handed Dennis a cigar which he savoured appreciatively whilst his colleagues looked on in amazement. He ended the evening playing piano duets with President Truman, who, according to Dennis, was a very able pianist. In the course of the next few days, terrible retribution befell Japan when atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August the 6th and 9th, respectively. The dreadful destruction and loss of life did not penetrate the mind as the news came through on the forces radio. There seemed to be a deep satisfaction, even euphoria amongst us that the Japs had got their desserts. But I remember as the days went by, several of us had distinct feelings of unease about its implications. Unable to fraternise with the Germans, it was difficult to discern their reaction to the news. When the Japanese surrendered on August the 14th, the general consensus seemed to indicate that the bombing attack was justified. 45 years later, the moral argument continues. Demobilisation was predictably the main topic of interest during the weeks that followed. The scheme of release according to age meant that older members would be first out. Group numbers were issued so that it was possible for each individual to calculate roughly when he might return to civilian life. It was an exciting prospect and when we at last returned to England in late September, I had estimated that I should be released in June 1946. Before leaving Germany, however, I must relate how my brother Leonard was prevented from taking further action against the drunken squadron leader. Bureaucratic procrastination had delayed immediate action, but a few days before we returned to England, he was sent for and told that if he wished to proceed with the case, he would have to stay in Germany for some months. 
there was also the veiled threat of being posted to the Far East. Understandably, he chose England. For most of the following months, many of us, ostensibly based in London, found ourselves assisting other bands depleted by demobilisation. I was sent to RAF College Cranwell, mercifully not for long. The constant parades of officer cadet passing out ceremonies and the general atmosphere of spit and polish was soul-destroying for serious musicians. It was a great relief when I was transferred to Bomber Command and stationed at Stanmore. To be in the London area once more, in a band directed by one of the country's finest musicians, George Malcolm, was a worthwhile experience, though sadly George was to be with us for only a short period before being demobilised. Nevertheless, life for the next few months was comparatively pleasant, with the opportunity of freelance work in London, which included several film and recording sessions at Denham Studios. Sports facilities were good too at Stanmore. There was an unforgettable football match against the Ted Heath Band when Jack Parnell, Harry Roach, formerly lead trombone with the BBC Dance Orchestra, and if my memory serves me well, Kenny Baker, showed their paces on the football pitch at Bomber Command HQ Stanmore in a contest which was both lively and at times hilarious. My estimation that June 1946 would be the month of my release proved to be correct and when the great day arrived my instructions were to report to the RAF depot Cardington. I knew little about Cardington except that it was in Bedfordshire and also that it was the home of the airship R101 which crashed in France in 1930. The organisation there was surprisingly efficient and in a very short time I found myself in a huge hangar chock full of civilian clothing. The tailor, I presumed he was a tailor, did not need his tape measure. Standard size, he called to the corporal, and within seconds I had a suit, overcoat and trilby thrust upon me, and in very short time I emerged fully dressed in civvies for the first time in almost six years. It was a strange feeling. My overcoat was neatly packed in a cardboard box and handed to me as I made my way along a passage towards the exit. But wait! At the end of that passage was a side door, and outside that door stood an RAF sergeant, all smiles as I approached him. Opening the door for me, he ushered me into a small room. Behind a desk sat an RAF officer who greeted me with a smile. Good afternoon, Mr Downs. I almost collapsed. Before you leave us... We wondered if you would be interested in signing for another five years' service. As you probably know, there are some marvellous opportunities with financial incentives should you decide to accept. I was completely speechless. Declining politely, I turned and left, never to return. End of chapter 10 To finish this podcast episode, I am going to play Andrew Down's Symphony No. 1 Movement 1, performed by the Czech Philharmonic Orchestra under Andrei Vrabets for the Artismon label. I have chosen this work because of the atomic bombs dropped in 1945 on Hiroshima and Nagasaki that my granddad talks about in this chapter. Andrew Dans composed this symphony shortly after writing his dramatic cantata A Child is Singing, which expresses the horrors of nuclear war and the tone of this cantata greatly influences much of the mood of the symphony. There is a feeling of emptiness, of the unknown, and of wandering in time and space. The work is written for organ, brass, percussion and strings. This recording was made in 2016 and can be purchased at andrewdowns.com.